This meeting is being recorded. Welcome everyone. We're gonna kick this off here in like 30 seconds. Please make your way in and find a seat. There's a lot of seats up front. No surprise. Okay. Well, welcome everyone to Housing Washington 2022, our first in-person conference in two years, and it sure has been a long time coming. I'm Steve Walker. I'm the director of the Washington State Housing Finance Commission, and together with the Washington Low Income Housing Alliance and the Washington State Department of Commerce, we are your hosts for this annual conference focused on affordable housing in Washington State. Um, just in, just minutes ago, I'm told that we have topped out at over 800 registrants in on site, which is amazing. So thank you all and congratulations. In the spirit of inclusion, I would like to open today by acknowledging that we stand on the ancestral homeland of the Spokane people. On behalf of the conference, we express our deepest respect and gratitude to these, our hosts and original land stewards who have walked for time immemorial in this area and are still here today. Being physically together again is truly wonderful. Over the past two years, having to do this conference virtually, and I know with whom I'm speaking has been tough, but it has also taught us so much especially about inclusion. We gained so many important tools to help us open the benefits of the conference to a much broader group of people interested in housing. For example, we hope you all took advantage of our two virtual lunchtime keynotes last week from Greg Colburn and Vu Lee. From here on, we will keep those virtual tools and add to them to the benefits and the pleasures of meeting together face to face. And seeing your faces last night at the Friend of Housing Award was just a fantastic experience. And I wanna take a minute to, again, honor the recipients of those awards. First of all, our Emerging Leader Award went to Antonia Medrano of OIC. We gave two Community Crisis Response Awards to both the Bremerton Housing Authority and Nancy Nash Mendez of the Okanagan Housing Authority. 
Next, we honored Terry Britt from right here in Spokane as a unsung hero. Also representative Frank Chop with a housing intersection award and especially Maureen Howard with the Margaret Seavey Lifetime Achievement Award. So if you see any of those folks today, please congratulate them and thank them. I also wanna take a moment to recognize and thank my board and staff at the Housing Finance Commission. Over the last two years, as the commission has been confronting our role in perpetuating systemic racism in housing, I've been so grateful for the leadership and true commitment to equity, which are always pushing us forward. Thanks to their effort, we have made some real progress to point to and to build on for the future, including a ground up redesign of one of our biggest funding programs to incentivize housing projects that are BIPOC owned, as well as projects that directly involve community-based organizations. This is the work we need to do, the work we will build on. Next year is the commission's 40th anniversary. And while we will take some time to celebrate our accomplishments, we will mostly be looking forward, ahead to a future that is centered on truly engaging and serving all people of the state so we can together shrink and eventually erase the egregious racial gaps we see in housing. And I know many of you share these same goals and I trust you will leave here tonight reinvigorated, inspired, and with, a, with new tools, resources, solidarity, and connections to use in this fight. Thank you again for joining us in person and for all you are doing to make housing in Washington both affordable and equitable. I am now gonna introduce uh, one of our, our prime sponsors, our platinum sponsor. Um, and as, I'm, as Mike is uh, making his way up, um, I want to ask um, Mike from Security Properties um, to come forward. Uh, Security Properties, um, excuse me, Sorry, Mike, <laughs> there is a security part. Hilltop Securities um, is one of our, is our platinum supporter and their support along with the support of all of our sponsors makes this conference possible. I was distracted by my notes because I've scribbled all over them now. I'm also told that we are over $117,000 in sponsorships this year with 56 sponsors and that is worth a hand. So please take some time to visit their booths and to thank them as well. Among our many longtime sponsors who are, you are now seeing, um, or maybe will soon be seeing on the screens here, um, we also have a new sponsor, Haplus. You may not know their name, but they support our work by supporting financial transactions by housing authorities and governments. And thanks to them, many of you enjoyed your first beverage last night at the Friend of Housing Awards. Again, we sincerely appreciate their support and the support of all of our sponsors. And now it is my pleasure to introduce to you, Micah Wattis, a Senior Managing Director for Hilltop Securities, to say a few words and to introduce our keynote speaker. Mike. Good morning. Wow. So on behalf of my colleagues, here at the conference and all of us at Hilltop Securities, I wanna say how honored and proud we are to sponsor this conference. It's truly one of the best statewide affordable housing conferences in the nation. And believe me, I go to quite a few of them a year. The credit goes to all of you for recognizing the importance of this conference, for being here and for supporting it. Hilltop Securities is humbled by our longstanding partnership with the commission this year marks the 10 year anniversary of the rollout of the Home Advantage program, arguably one of the most successful home ownership programs of its kind in the nation. When the commission decided to roll out this program in 2012, their goal simply was to make and expand home ownership opportunities to all low and moderate income potential home buyers in the state. Just to put this tremendous achievement in perspective. Since the inception of the program, 
the commission provided over 14.7 billion, yes, with a B, dollars of financing for mortgages for first time home buyers, serving over 56,500 families in the state. In addition, the commission made available over $550 million of down payment assistance. And we all know how important that program is to get borrowers to qualify for their mortgages. We are all too familiar with the housing challenges we face as an industry. I want to give a shout out to my friend, Lisa DeBrock, her entire home ownership team for doing a tremendous job with this program for their tireless dedication for making affordable and sustainable home ownership a reality for all Washingtonians. She and the team are constantly exploring ways to improve affordability, deploying resources, and being innovative in the midst of all the challenges. Of course, none of this would be possible without Steve's leadership and the support of the commissioners and who, who always support the staff in implementing these programs. Please join me in giving a applause to the team and their hard work and their dedication to this mission. And now I am delighted to introduce this morning's keynote speaker. Dr. Lauren R. Carter is the founder and CEO of C-Suites Equity Consulting an award-winning equity, justice, and social impact firm where she works to foster equity through strategy development, community-focused solutions, and capacity building to make urban spaces equitable places. She is a passionate about facilitating healthy, vibrant communities and equipping people with tools needed to be independent determinants of their destiny. With almost two decades of education, and experience spanning civil engineering, law, higher education, public policy, and urban planning. Her work to facilitate equitable communities in Dallas has led the, to the record-breaking $6 million equitable development investment by J.P. Morgan Chase Foundation in the Dallas communities of South Dallas, Oak Cliff, and West Dallas, and the creation of community-driven programming and initiatives for the neighborhood surrounding the Trinity River. Most recently, Dr. Carter led the equitable development process for the upcoming Southern Gateway Deck Park during the COVID-19 pandemic, resulting in a community-driven plan leveraging over 80 million in infrastructure investment for community benefits to increase access to opportunity and redress existing racial disparities in the Oak Cliff community and was awarded the region-wide peer-reviewed Dunnegan Engagement Award for C-Suite's work on the project that resulted in a community-focused park redesign to remedy decades of disinvestment. Her firm now is serving as a strategic partner for the first ever community-driven large-scale plan in West Dallas and continues to work to help others understand current inequities how equitable development can positively leverage investment and communities of color and pathways to more equitable and just future. When she's done doing all these things outside work, she enjoys spending time with her husband who's here, family, friends, visiting local farmer markets in restaurants in Dallas, listening to live music, supporting other small businesses and exploring local parks and trails. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lauren R. Carter to the stage. Good morning. Okay, we'll try it one more time. I'm from the South, so we like to have a little participation. Good morning. 
There we go. All right. I am Dr. Lauren Carter. I'm very thankful and excited to be here with you today to talk about a few topics that are near and dear to me. Um, I look at this as a conversation between myself and all of the conference attendees. So I'll start the conversation with this presentation, and then we'll have ample time at the end for questions or anything to clarify. Sound good? All right. So today I have the topic of systemic racism, urban development, upward mobility, and high displacement gentrification, all right? Simple stuff for this morning to get us started. <laughs> all right, and I do wanna say thank you again to the conference committee uh, for having us here. And thank you to my husband for always being a wonderful support. All right, so today what we wanna look at is those key topics, but it's gonna have a slightly different spin than you may be expecting because I want to talk about how did we get here, underlying factors, not just the symptoms that we see and hear reported often. Okay. Why now, why this topic? Housing pressures across the nation, including Washington, are increasing. Uh, COVID-19 only intensified them. And so now is the time where we really have to evaluate what's been working, identify those areas that need some additional support and find ways to move forward. Uh, in our firm, we always talk about making sure we address what's happened, but our main focus is on ways that we can move forward together equitably. Okay. So a few key terms to get us all started so you know where my base is as I present. So gentrification, uh, there are a number of different definitions for it. The original definition is by Ruth Glass, who talked about gentrification as an invasion, as a takeover of current neighborhoods uh, where people from higher classes or the gentry class where she was in London were taking over neighborhoods of people that earned lower incomes. It was a rapid replacement. So as they moved in, culture changed, the character of the neighborhood changed, and also the citizens of that place changed. And then we talk about or think about displacement. And displacement is the removal or replacement of a few key things. One, think about access. What can you meaningfully access, use, uh, have um, entry to? And then the types of spaces. So are there communal spaces, community spaces, or even local businesses that are being removed and replaced? And then that sense of culture. It's very different as people move and as your key neighborhood uh, hallmarks begin to change, the sense of place begins to feel different. And this is the change between those who are originally inhabitants to the area or historical or legacy residents and those who are incoming or moving into the neighborhood. Now, these two terms are often used interchangeably. They are not the same. Gentrification talks about a change, replace, removal of one culture for another. Gentrification is looking at that entire process, and it ties that displacement to investment that is key to higher income taste. So while they often happen in the same place, often around the same time, they are two very different terms, but they normally happen uh, in the same place. But know that they are different. And there are multiple types of displacement as well. Okay. So then the big one, we heard this a little bit in our intro to this session about systemic racism. I want to go ahead and get it out there. So it's an intentional process of ingraining a belief, not only in one person, but in an entire society of a racial hierarchy. It benefits a particular race at the disadvantage or harm to all other races. And for the particular race that is the beneficial um, one in the system, they have very special benefits. There's privileges uh, just to their presence or their mere application to certain things. And it's not an isolated incident. When we say systemic, we mean throughout all societal systems. So that's banking. Um, when you think about education, that's in societal and political power. It's a part of the fabric of how that society operates. 
and then economic mobility. So we're getting these all out the way now because we'll hear them uh, more in the presentation later. But think about economic mobility as your ability to move up the ladder of economic success, but it's measured from your birth. So where are you born economically? What is the class or status that you're born into? And how can you with education or hard work, uh, how easy is it for you to move from one tier of economic status to the other? Okay. So how did we get here? And we're talking about these terms to give a frame of reference for our conversation today. When you throw out things like gentrification and displacement, people always look at, or often look at the numbers that come afterwards. So we see changes in demographics. We see changes in median income. We see changes in racial composition, but we don't often talk about what precipitated that change. And that's what we'll talk about today. So again, going back to systemic racism, these conditions did not just magically appear. Uh, it was an intentional practice. And over centuries, these things have taken place that have really created an environment that is ripe for exploitation of groups that earn lower incomes and that are racial, uh, were racial minorities, but that is currently changing now in the world's outlook. Okay, so we'll do a brief timeline. We start with redlining. I'm sure you all have heard that term if you're in housing. And it really was a federally created system. So the federal government sent local estimators out into neighborhoods across the country and created an A through D rating system. A, think about it like green to red when you're in traffic. A was green, D was red. So if you're in an A neighborhood, it was normally 100% white. Uh, median to upper income. If you were in a D neighborhood that was classified with a red outline and shading, you were normally 100% people of color or and or lower income earners. Okay, so not only did the federal government use this as its guideline, private industry took it as well to say, if the government has said these places are not right for investment, we're not willing to take uh, the chance to invest in those places. And so you see from the 1920s to the 1930s, when this happened across the nation, if you match those maps together with social demographics now, you'll see those things still have not changed over 100 years later. Our next is looking at federally backed mortgages. So when our country was in great distress after the Great Depression, uh, we had support coming in to get the banks back in motion and also to help consumers and citizens have access to home ownership. However, it was not equitable or equal access, and most people of color were often denied access to those home mortgages. What this did long term was decrease the earning ability and the ability to uh, accumulate generational wealth that could be passed down from one generation in a family to the next, uh, impacting long term wealth in uh, families of color. Next, we had the advent of highways, which made it easy for those who were earning more to move out of the city because now they had easy transportation access to and from, and they transferred the cost of higher housing in the city with transportation costs to take advantage of lower housing costs in the suburbs. This has also happened uh, around the same time you hear the term of white flight. These were all supported by mortgages and by the advent of highways where people could move to and from easily. Next, we move to the phase of urban renewal, um, often by some experts call urban removal. And this is where the federal government again came into play and in some cases completely raised neighborhoods of color to erect concentrated areas of lower income and or people of color communities. Um, changing the face of neighborhoods generationally uh, and often making it difficult to access that economic mobility we talked about on a previous slide. Next, we look at fair housing laws, which were enacted to help counter some of these actions, um, enacted in 1964 and 68, uh, but still having issues actually affirmatively furthering fair housing. Uh, later in 2015 and subsequent years, there's been a new federal push to try to make the um, essence of those laws a reality now. And then we move to something that's a little bit more current, 
the 1990s to our current timeline, where we see a refocus on urban centers and coming back to develop the urban core, uh, rebuilding downtowns. We had a chance to visit uh, the riverfront here, which is beautiful. Um, but that kind of investment uh, around the country started happening around this time to bring people back to the urban core. What that did in some cases was as higher incomes came in and were able to afford higher rents, uh, landlords recognized what we call a rent gap. So they saw a demand that could uh, supply a much higher rent for their property compared to their current tenants and people were often displaced. And when those new residents came in, their tastes were often different in what uh, they preferred or requested, causing a change in culture uh, and additional displacement of those spaces as well. Then we get to the housing crisis of 2008 and 2009, which changed the face of our housing market for about 10 years, uh, actually really started recovering mid 20 uh, teens. And then we had COVID which changed our landscape once again. In 2020, uh, there was really a boom in increasing home ownership, but as we saw rates begin to rise in 2021 and continuing in 2022, it's become more difficult uh, for those outside of higher incomes and for people of color to have access to um, home ownership, right? Also during COVID, we've had supply chain issues, which have again increased the cost of housing, making it much, much less affordable to build. Um, and one project that we're working on in Dallas, uh, homes initially with a city sponsored program were to be no more than $230,000. Now those same homes, same plan due to the cost of materials and the housing market are now looking to sell at about $290,000. Uh, and that project started at the mid to end of 2019. So as you incorporate the changes that we're having to face with higher demand and lower supply uh, because of lack of work during COVID, a uh, lack of source of materials and a much higher demand than a housing sp supply that's available, you start to see these issues impacting home prices and rental prices. And now we're entering another housing crisis um, where rents have increased in the double digits and home ownership, uh, that goal is again moving for first time home buyers, making it much more difficult to enter the market and to gain equity. So as we think about economic mobility and the person's ability to move or change economic classes during their lifetime, you look at a comparison of our parents uh, or grandparents, depending on where you are in, uh, in this room, uh, and your ability to move up by generations. So when you look at those who were born in 1940, their chance of out-earning their parents was almost 100%, right? So if they started and their parents were earning $50,000 a year, they had almost 100% return on increasing that amount in their household. As we get to 1990 or 80, uh, those numbers are decreasing about 20%. Uh, and then as you get to the higher or the top income percentile, you see that possibility is less than 10% to out earn our parents. Then if we look at income classes, um, their aggregate share of the US market in 1970, we had a very um, robust middle class. Now you'll see that percentage has shifted very much to uh, the upper class by 20% and we're losing our middle class. So all of these things impact the ability of a larger portion of people to access affordable housing and long-term housing. Okay, and hopefully you can see this one. Uh, on the left is an example of that redlining map that I mentioned before. So in the green spaces and yellow spaces, um, green is A, B is blue, C is yellow, and D is red. If you compare that, and this is Spokane, if you compare that to the right side of the map, you'll see most of those colors are still the same. Uh, this map was probably about 1932. 
and we're in 1922 and not much change has happened. So this is showing that federal investment, federal direction, uh, which is copied or also implemented by private investment can have long-term effects and impact generations to come. And now look at owner trends. So in home ownership rates from 2010 to 2020, uh, and this is a few years after where we had the housing crisis, you'll see every race uh, on the map has slightly increased with uh, Hispanic households actually reaching a landmark amount of over 50% home ownership. Uh, Black households have dipped slightly below their 2020, excuse me, their 2010 uh, home ownership rate. There are a number of factors that are measured into this. Uh, minority groups were those who were most impacted by the housing crisis, um, often from predatory lending, uh, and they're also the most acceptable to income variations or changes. And this one may be a little hard to see, but we look at the home ownership rates for white Americans and we'll be comparing on the right hand side to each of the other groups. For white Americans, it's about 64%. For black Americans, this was 34%. And then we look at Asian Americans, they're closer uh, on parity and I think they're right at 62%. And I'm looking at Washington state in comparison. And then we have Hispanic Americans, which are also at about 40%. So again, impacting long range generational wealth and ability to access the market. When you have lower home ownership rates, you have a higher probability and possibility of being displaced because you don't own the place what you call home or in which you stay. So you become very vulnerable to market transitions if a landlord or the actual owner of the property would like to have more income for that parcel or property. And then we look at denial rates. So not only the ability to access through income and um, to be able to purchase, but also what is the system implications? How are people recognized? How are they approved or denied uh, on a pro rata basis by um, by race. And so on the left hand side, you'll see the denial rate in Washington for white households, I think it's about 11 or 17%. And then um, in Washington, which you actually are one of the best states for black households in the nation. And you'll see that also on the right hand side, where Washington ranks number four in the bottom graph. But looking across the country, you can see denial rates for black households at almost a two to one ratio to white households. Again, impacting the ability to earn and to have generational wealth and to be secure in the places that they call home. Okay, so then we look at affordability, which is a topic um, in recent conversation. Most households in America now are cost burdened, meaning that they're having to pay 30% or more than their household income. So if they're... Um, paying that much, that means if anything else happens, they're much more vulnerable economically. So if an emergency happens, there's less funds to be able to react to that. If there's a health issue, there's less funds to be able to react to that um, pressure in the market. Okay. So we'll continue with housing affordability. And here you'll see change in rents from Q1 of 2020 to Q1 of 2022. This is for Washington state moving across uh, the state. And some places you'll see as high as almost 24% uh, for any household that's difficult to be able to capture uh, a quarter increase in your rent in two years, especially during a time where in many households, income has decreased uh, or been inconsistent due to COVID and many households are still recovering from the last three years of economic instability. So now we'll look at how rents have changed uh, and where they're up in the nation. So if we look here in 2021, again, you'll see double digit increases across the nation in rental prices. Uh, for most households, you can probably cover about 
a 3%, 3 to 5% easily um, or with a little bit of stretching. But when you get into the double digits, that could also result in severe cost burden for renters, which is 50% or more of their income being spent on rental housing. Again, here taking a look at the most affordable states uh, for renters that are currently facing cost burden issues. And about 40 to 44 percent of renters in Washington state are having difficulty paying rent uh, because it's such a large portion of their income. And again, this is over 30 percent of what comes in every month to go out uh, for housing costs. Now, this is one breakdown of when we talk about the rental market, uh, who are renters? What does that group, what, who's tenure? Um, what is the sociodemographic classification of those groups? And when you look at it across the nation, they're mostly single uh, or single parents and often people of color. Um, one of the things with being a renter as rental prices increase, it makes it more difficult to save for a home if the money that you are saving now has to cover the cost of your monthly uh, housing costs, which again increases that gap in the ability to access wealth and to be secure in your home. Okay. And this is a brief graph of how rental rates have changed over the last few years. You'll see pretty even curves with a slight spike in 2015 as the market was correcting from the 2008 and 2009 housing crisis. We had a dip in 2020 as everyone was really adjusting to COVID and trying to stay in business and afloat. There were also other support mechanisms in place locally and federally to keep people in their homes uh, and also to help landlords keep their properties. But as we transitioned into 2021, and a lot of those properties were up for renewal as the housing market increased. So homes that before were selling for 300,000 are now on the market for 450 due to a greater demand and a lack of supply. Uh, a lot of those higher income earners are moving to apartments. And again, that rental gap that's present, landlords are taking advantage of that opportunity and you'll see rental prices increasing. Another factor in this is as those other sales are happening and home values increase, the tax assessments increase as well for surrounding properties. So to capture and be able to cover some of those costs, landlords may also raise rent uh, to make sure that that cost is covered and their profit margins are not impacted could also be um, an additional way to recoup some of the losses that they had in 2020 and 2021 due to non-payment of rent uh, due to other issues with COVID. Okay. The other portion that we'll think about here are things that are outside of our control. Federal interest rates. Uh, we've seen historic numbers this year uh, with 3% increases just in 2020 and the promise of 1 to 1.5% increases in the federal interest rate between now and the end of 2023. What this does is makes things more expensive to purchase and for homes or households that are already cost burdened or that are earning lower, it makes it more difficult for them to access affordable housing and to stay in the homes that they um, reside in now. Other issues we mentioned before with supply chain and the inability to get materials in a timely fashion or at a rate commiserate to what was available in 2019. Those things are impacting overall development costs, which increase cost of either home sale prices or rental prices in the market. And then the final one is looking at long COVID. And I know we normally think about that as a health issue, but I want you to think about it from an economic perspective. And this is households that, again, have lost incomes, one or two, um, that are still reeling from additional health costs that have been brought on by COVID. All of this, again, impacts their ability to afford housing uh, in places that are safe and secure for themselves and their family. All right, so what are some things we can think about as we continue to move forward? One, thinking about accessory dwelling units. 
one of the great things about these options is with smaller requirements, these homes are less costly, which could be an easier entry point uh, for those that are first time home buyers or that are in middle income markets. The next is thinking about community land trust. So this locks in affordability long term. And one of the key things here is that community residents are the ones that can dictate and donate what land or what parcels are included and how that land is used in the community. Um, so they can contribute parcels that they own, they can go in together and purchase new parcels. Um, and it helps give the residents of a place the ability to help mitigate so much of the displacement that happens, but also to help guide the change as it occurs. And then protective tax measures. So in a lot of neighborhoods that have lower incomes or that have been historically um, been inhabited by people of color, land values have been decreased due to disinvestment over several decades. And so it's easy to come in and fall victim to land speculation. So one of the ways to do this is have protective measures in place where that won't happen or where development can happen in a way that's equitable and the community is included in that growth. The other portion of that is thinking about how taxes are assessed. Uh, and there are a number of creative ways to do that. It doesn't only have to be a rent cap. It can be at percentages. It can be on a sliding scale, but thinking about how you can incorporate everyone into the growth as it continues to happen. Next is thinking about increasing your program AMI. Many programs at the federal and state or local level uh, focus on 80 AMI or less, several looking at about 60% AMI. A lot of buyers in the middle income earner class or status are having extreme difficulty accessing properties that are um, available to meet their needs. So if programs were increased to give additional support to that group, it could help stabilize the middle class and increase access to a larger group of home buyers. The next is thinking about middle housing solutions. In a lot of markets, there are luxury apartments and estate homes, but not as much in the middle for uh, people who are first time home buyers. So are smaller three, two or town homes, row homes, garden homes, uh, condos, having a variety of options that users can take advantage of and to enter the market uh, where they may even be able to resell that to another homeowner that's entering the market as they move up in the homeowner status, okay? Um, and then one of the most important things is including residents in solutions. It's very easy to do these things separate and apart from the people who will be directly impacted. But one of the things our firm always likes to do is think about local expertise. The people that know the area best are the people that call it home. They can tell you market conditions. They can tell you what's changed in real time because they live there every day. So incorporating them into the solutions that are developed is key. Is key. The next is thinking about maintaining existing housing stock. Often there's naturally occurring affordable housing. Uh, again, as I said, as people move through the market, one of the issues that happens as you lose housing stock is when those homes aren't maintained. So think about your seniors and having programs that can help them update or improve their homes. So the next starter family can come in when that senior decides to move to Florida uh, to go be with their grandkids. That home will now be available to a first time home buyer at a much more accessible price than a new home built today, um, which in most markets average is about 350 to 400,000 thousand dollars due to cost of material and the current market. And doing that helps to increase the resiliency of your market. When you have a diversity of home buyers from renters all the way to estate homes, it makes sure that there's a variety of uh, housing options available. And so if things change in the market, there's always a place where people can find a safe home depending on where their incomes fall at that time. Okay. And then consider equitable development. This is one of the things our firm specializes in. Uh, we think about 
solutions in a holistic way. And part of that is because our work is looking to redress and address systemic racism as it shows itself in environmental, economic, and social context. And because when we talked about on that, those introductory slides, systemic means throughout all of societal systems. So we can't focus solely on one portion of the solution. It needs to be done in a way that's holistic. So if we're thinking about housing, how does that tie into transportation? How is housing impacted by green development like parks? Um, what are other things when we think about education? How does that impact housing as well? So taking a holistic view of the system because the people that move into those homes or that are, are being displaced from those homes are not just being displaced or living in the home, they're a part of that community. And so when you think about building the community up, housing is a key part of that because it's foundational to safety. It can help you think about solutions in a more equitable and holistic way. Okay. And then the final one is thinking about metric evaluation. It's really easy to set goals with no way to measure true success. Metrics allow you to hone in and target what you're doing, your efforts, how you're spending money with key ways to measure if you're impacting the people that you sought out to help initially. So one common thing that we see in research or in communities and reporting is that investment will be made and the reporting metric will say incomes rose, housing values rose, but was it impacting the people who lived there initially? Did they get a chance to benefit from the changes and the investment that was made or was it an effort that resulted in gentrification and displacement. So having key metrics in place that can help guide not only how you invest, but how you make adjustments to your investment for the long term. And here's an example, hopefully you can see this, of what we've done in a previous project. So thinking about what you're looking for as a solution, then figuring out who's involved. Is this something that's tactical? So is the community the lead on this? Is it something that a planning agency needs to do? Or is it something policy-wise that government should be a part of? And then you look at your success metrics. Who are we impacting? So if this project is looking at three zip codes, are we measuring overall impact or those three zip codes? And are we doing that by race, by income, by educational attainment? How are we measuring our success and our impact? And then realizing you can't do it all yourself, which is why you're all in the room today to figure out how you can partner with other organizations to bring the goal that you have of the ability to access and stay in affordable housing a reality. All right, and that was perfect time. And I just got the note, we are open for questions. So I will start with the ones that we have in the app. And then I think Cheryl and Catherine are in the audience, if there are any additional questions. Okay. So the first question is, how can we collectively work to dismantle systemic racism when those that are guilty of it or just uncomfortable with it would much rather ignore it and forget it than decipher it to diffuse it? All right. So one of the things I would say on this, thinking about collective work, is figuring out what your goal is in that collective. Is it to shame? Is it to um, bring, to shame the person that's coming in and make them feel guilty about what's happened? Or is it saying, this is what's happened? These are the things that we're facing. How can we use our collective resources to move forward? Um, People will still have the decision to choose. What you can control is how you operate, um, who you choose to partner with, what your goals are, and the way that your funds are distributed. Um, having data also helps to support um, being able to change people's minds, quantitative and qualitative data that can support um, what you're showing with uh, what's happened. And Systemic racism is a fact. I mean, it's what's happened in our nation 
It is how our nation has operated. Uh, now we're moving towards, as a nation, changing that. And it may take some people longer to accept that and to move forward, but you have to start the work and partner with other people that want to move it forward and show them the impact of that change as you go and hope that they will join you in process. Okay. The next question is how can we better advocate the implementation of building wealth and achieving home ownership within urban dominated school systems to train youth to invest their monies in stock, real estate, and the purchasing of property while they are still young enough to do so? Um, I think some of this is can be nonprofit work where you have um, clinics on the weekend, or it could be advocating for curriculum in your school system that will teach this just like you do everything else in middle school. Uh, I know we used to have career development. I don't know if that's still a thing uh, in school, but where they taught you and expose you to different types of careers could be another elective or project that goes um, forward. New Jersey, in probably the last two years, passed a um, state law that now has education, no, economic literacy as a part of their K through 12 system. So if you're looking for an example, that might be one that you can use uh, to help as you're having those conversations with your elected officials or with other community partners to push that forward. The next question is, is it possible to foster an environment of diversity, equity, and inclusion that promotes upward mobility when there are still so many companies that would rather place an ap applicant where they feel they belong than actually get to know them and identify them as a person? And so when you talk about DEI, and we like to add or say DEIB, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, there's a spectrum. So diversity is having a person in a space, different types of people in a space. Equity is having something where everyone has what they need. Inclusion moves forward from equity to everyone having what they need, and they're also being welcomed in the space. And then belonging is where they're affirmatively a part of the fabric of that culture, or that place. Um, so when you're thinking about how to foster that environment, uh, it starts with leadership. And you'll have to have some approval or an investment from the top that will make that a priority for the company to move that forward. And then also know that everyone won't play the same part. So you may have a sponsor, which is someone who speaks your name in meetings, that knows you well, that knows your credentials, that can recommend you for opportunities. There may be a mentor that you work with that helps you navigate your working relationships and environments to help you as you work to move forward and up that corporate ladder. And then there's allies who are working with you to help one, understand, uh, where things are and how you experience the place as a person of color, as a woman, and that can help um, make a safe space for you in your working environment. So not everyone will play the same role, but you have to find key partners that can help you navigate each of those different components as you move forward. Uh, and it's possible. It takes concerted effort, guidance from leadership, and investment uh, in the commitment to make it a part of how you operate, so a core value and not a standalone initiative. It has to be a part of the company, not something that could be terminated in five years for not performing well. Okay. The next question is, shouldn't the first part of gentrification begin with assessing the needs of the community by going directly to the root of the source rather than rendering life-altering decisions on their behalf without seeking their consent. So we talked a little bit uh, about that in one of the slides about involving the community in conversation. And I would say the first part of development or investment, not the first part of gentrification, because we don't want to go in with the idea of changing the entire culture of a place or citizens 
of a place, a residence of a place, want to go in thinking about how can this investment improve the overall community, improve the access, the resources, the quality of life that exists in this neighborhood so that people who live here can benefit and enjoy it uh, first because they've been here, they've invested in the community, but a place that also welcomes newcomers and those who are returning to the area. And that's how our firm defines equitable development. It's looking to redress harms. It's looking to make sure that those who have lived there and are legacy residents benefit from investment, but it also creates a welcoming environment to those who are moving in or are moving back. Okay. Then we have what are methods other than community land trusts that have been executed in order to preserve affordable single family housing. So some of those we talked about uh, tax restrictions, um, putting in overlays in neighborhoods, neighborhood stabilization overlays that can help um, maintain the character of the place for existing homes, doing plans that create guidelines for what can be constructed. So height restrictions, size restrictions, restrictions restrictions, setback restrictions, all of those things can help maintain the character of a place um, and to help to offset some of the increase in cost as new homes are built. Okay. Ooh, so I don't hear. All right. Can you talk about more middle housing tools and strategies? Washington affordable housing is very focused on the neediest populations. How have other geographies across the country approached addressing the entire continuum of housing options? So we talked about that a little bit. And one of the solutions there, again, is looking at who the program can serve, uh, having additional, excuse me, down payment assistance um, for larger, a larger span of groups. I'm thinking about incentives for building uh, in middle income in the middle income range. There are a lot of incentives uh, like LIHTC properties for low income developments or for affordable housing for the 60 or 80% AMI and city housing plans and resolutions. You can also add that in to how your housing department operates in your city um, with housing authorities, that's a little bit more difficult with their federal mandates of the population that they serve, but there could be creative ways to leverage those things as well. Um, and one of the things a lot of people are not as familiar with with housing authorities is that you can use vouchers to purchase a home. So while people are using those to rent, uh, having home buyer education uh, or rental education that there that can also be used as a pathway to ownership is something that you can also do. Right. Are the right tools and platforms in place to encourage minority renters to understand the benefits of owning versus renting such that they desire to pursue home ownership? And then the second portion is readiness. For applicants who are not yet mortgage ready, are there systems and practices in place to help them overcome the barriers they face that may be within their control? And so I'll manage the first part of that first think so much it's a lack of desire as it is lack of access and lack of resources. When we looked back at the generations long impact of federal and local and private decisions over the last 100 years, those things uh, are not changing overnight. And so there are a number of other obstacles that um, renters of color are looking to overcome, not the most of which is the desire to pursue it. Often there's just difficulty in accessing that. Um, but just like every other racial group, not everyone wants to be a homeowner. They may just want um, the comforts of living in a place where everything else is taken care of. And then readiness. Um, there are often a lot of programs, depending on where you are, one of the key issues with the programs is that people don't know about them. So it's often not the program, it's the information and the knowledge of the population you're looking to serve are just not aware of the resources that are available. So often doing campaigns that increase awareness helps to increase the numbers of those who actually um, access the resources that are available, okay? Our next question is, how are you tracking rent increases? What sources are you using? And are you somehow compiling various sources? So we are not compiling them, but there are a number of agencies that do. Normally, the Rental Housing Association in your state will compile those uh, for um, rental properties in your state. You can also look at uh, realtor markets or realtor reports. Um, they will have those for home prices and 
I would probably also look at HUD. They normally do um, compile those types of resources as well, uh, some on a quarterly basis and others on an annual basis. Okay. How do you and your team navigate equity and anti-racist housing work in a difficult state political environment? Given a lack of funding at the state level, what resources do you rely on for cultivating equitable development in your community? Okay, so a lot of what we do, you saw on the previous slide, Let's see if it goes back. Here we go. Um, here where you'll see tactical. So in our work, we don't think it's the sole responsibility of government to correct this. While they do have a very key part to play, um, there are things communities can do, there are things private industry can do, um, there are things philanthropists can do to help invest. Um, the projects that were mentioned earlier in my bio, like one of those or most of the projects have been sponsored or funded through philanthropic organizations who are looking to give back and invest in communities. And so we had in one of those projects that started in 2018, um, it was a planning grant for 2018 to 2019. And the report was so successful, we had a great community buy-in. The JP Morgan Chase decided to invest $6 million into those three communities. There's some for workforce development and job training, some for community leadership, uh, some that was developing for um, entrepreneurship classes and job force readiness. And then there was about, I want to make sure I get, think about 1.6 million for housing. Some of that was working with community development corporations who would take that and purchase land to build affordable housing within a three year period. Um, others was to help with like pre-construction costs. Some was land acquisition. And so there are other creative ways that you can do it. And honestly, once the government saw investment was coming in from private donors, um, then it helped to spark and get encouragement for um, additional public investment to those areas. Okay. And then the last one is, would you explain critical race theory and why is it important to be taught in schools? So this one is not directly on subject for the presentation. Um, what, and this more, so I'll say this, critical race theory is really just examining the racial constructs in America. Most schools don't necessarily have that as part of the curriculum. Uh, it's normally initially when it was taught at a much higher level um, without knowing more. I am hesitant to say anything else because that, uh, depending on the circumstance, can get a little touchy. So if you had this question and you want to talk about it more, I'll be available afterwards. Um, but I think with that, the bigger picture of how we think about this is certain populations have the option of when they have to talk about and consider racism. Other segments of the population do not. When I walk in a room, you know I'm a woman, you know I'm black, and pretty soon as I talk, start talking, you understand I'm from the South. I don't do as good a job of uh, covering that accent anymore. But when we enter places or people like me enter places, there's immediate reaction to who we are as people uh, just on physical appearance before you even know anything about us personally. Because that exists, um, it is already in schools. Racism is already there because there is immediate bias uh, by race. And so what we can do instead of focusing so much on a title is think about how are we treating each other fairly? How are we treating each other equally? How are we treating each other equitably in our systems and making sure that even in education as our children are getting that base, that everybody feels welcome, everybody feels taken care of, they feel included in the spaces that they're in and they feel they have access to the resources that they need to succeed. Getting more into the political side of that is not where I like to reside. Uh, I prefer to reside more on solution uh, focused discussions and more on collaboration building and finding ways that we can allow everyone to feel comfortable, welcomed, and to feel secure in the places that we call home or that we call our school campuses. All right. I think that is, thank you. Um, 
Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Carter, for skillfully going through the WUFA Act. And if you, if, if, if you don't know about this app, this is the one you used for the virtual if you were on it. If you are not, go on it because you can ask questions um, even in advance on any of the sessions here and the speakers will be looking at them. Are there any questions? We have just a couple more minutes. If there's anybody who's not on the app who would like to um, ask a question. You know, Dr. Carter, I think you got it. All thank right. you so much. All right, thank you all. All right. Hello. Okay, before everyone rushes out, I want to I want to thank Dr. Carter one more time, please. And Dr. Carter, I'll just say thank you for sharing with us today. Um, I really did appreciate your timeline and and just how starkly it laid out um, in detail and a powerful reminder of the work we have ahead of us and as well as bringing some solutions and ideas. So thank you for that as well. Um, I wanna make just one plug for everyone, just so you, if you missed it, keep an eye out for it next year. But many of you um, met Rachel Myers uh, last week um, as part of our Thursday and Friday kickoff to the Housing Washington. We had the two virtual sessions by uh, Greg Colburn and Vu Lee. And I'm, I'm, I'm just wanna say that we're really excited to be able to bring both uh, the Housing Washington group together with the Low Income Housing Alliance's um, Homeless Conference. So we bring both of those two conferences together. We've done it for the last two years, and we really believe that we've hit the mark on, on just expanding conversations as well as overlapping content. So just wanted to, if you missed it, keep an eye out for that next year. If you participated in that, um, I'm sure you really, really got a lot out of it. Um, so this concludes our keynote today. Um, just as a reminder, we're gonna get going again at about 1045. I wanna encourage everyone to go in and uh, visit with uh, our vendors, um, take a little bit of time to do that, say hi, and remember they are sponsors of the conference as well, and so thank them for that. And with that, um, I'll just remind you that the ever popular David Bradley um, will be our lunch keynote, so uh, you don't wanna miss that. Thank you all. Thank you.